Act two, scene four. Duncan is confirmed dead. Uh, the whole crew were gathered inside the castle and they saw the body and Donald Bain and Malcolm ran away. Very, very tense scene. So after that tense scene, uh, the audience um, needs uh, a bit of change of pace. And so what uh, a playwright will very often do or a filmmaker will very often do is they'll have like a, a calming scene where things can still be tense, but there's not much action going on. Uh, and that's what we see here. The, the audience is taking a breath. Uh, we're outside Macbeth's castle now. So we were, were focused on the interior where all that mayhem was going on and the tension. And now what's happening is that there, uh, there's a perspective shift and we get kind of a man on the street, a person on the street perspective that I think demonstrates the ripple effect of the murder. The murder happened at this epicenter and now the effects of it are gonna be felt all throughout Scotland, the wasteland taking its place. So we get this, we get Ross, he's outside the castle and he's talking to this random old guy. We have no idea who he is. There's no, nothing else. He only has like five lines or something like that and then he just disappears. But again, it, it's, it's, an, it's a reestablishing shot. Uh, it's a pacing shot. It slows things down. It lets the audience t catch its breath. Um, it also serves a few other functions as well. Um, we've, we've seen already a recap scene. Um, remember that Shakespeare was uh, writing for a, a popular audience. It was, they were Hollywood movies. He was basically an Avengers writer. And if he were alive today, he'd be making, you know, movies on HBO or, you know, Avengers films or whatever. He'd be doing all that stuff because he loves it. He loved entertaining people, uh, but he was a high artist as well as a low artist. And, and that's where all the, the porter scene jokes were the low artist in him uh, making, you know, sex jokes and stuff like that. He, he, he loved it. Uh, he wanted to make money. He was a businessman, too, as I already mentioned. So we have to remember that there, there were groundlings in attendance in the audience. And so these recap scenes, um, they do recap for people who've lost attention. And it wasn't just the groundlings that would lose attention. Let me just show you some of these scenes. Uh, these are some clips of what the globe would have looked like uh, back in Shakespeare's day. This is the modern version of it, of course, because Shakespeare's people didn't dress in football jerseys, I don't think. Um, so the stage would have looked like this. Uh, the groundlings, these guys would have been groundlings. They would have been the penny seats, and they weren't seats at all. You had to stand up. Uh, it would have been un the unwashed masses, as they say. Uh, so the higher up you go, the further away you get from the stink. So that meant you had a little bit of uh, social status, so you could afford the more expensive seats. Um, interestingly, the most expensive seats would have been back here, right in behind. Let me show you. So this is a perspective from the groundlings. You would be actually leaning. You'd be, you'd be, you know, your hands would be, you'd actually be resting on this, on the stage. It, everything was close. It was tight and it was noisy and it was rambunctious. It was like a day at the circus rather than a... We tend to think of Shakespeare today as something like going to church. You know, we go to church and we sit there and we pray to this God. Shakespeare, uh, he wasn't like that at all, of course. He was, a, he was a, an entertainer of the masses. As you can see with this movie, quote-unquote, movie palace, this grand... Today we have malls, these great popular entertainment complexes and these gigantic malls that are gorgeously arrayed and there's food and there's noise and there's entertainment and there's, there's just about everything. Um, it's so why not you know why not we, we go for the weekend we work all week it's dull and it's boring and we come in here and we, we escape to a fantasy people in London these are old Roman Corinthian capitals this gold gilded gilded stuff it, it was it was it was it was a it was a fun day out well, not night fun day out because they needed the sunlight uh, anyway so interestingly right up here these were these were the most prestigious seats because uh, back in those days they didn't say like we want to go to see a movie today look what I just said I just said let's go see a movie back in those days they didn't say that they didn't say let's watch a movie let's see a movie let's see a play they would say let's go hear a play yeah I heard a play yesterday that's the word that they used so that that tells you the, the shift in focus in our culture we're a very visual culture today and as I said we go to Avengers movies and are just blown away and a lot of it's great and a lot of it's not so great of course you get a mix of everything Shakespeare wasn't the only playwright and there's a lot of not so great plays but we only get the best ones and of Shakespeare's plays we only watch the best ones because a lot of his plays weren't great either um, so yeah it's all good stuff it's all entertainment stuff um, but some stuff is gooder than other stuff I suppose uh, anyway so the, we 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 are a visual culture and we enjoy our visual stimulus, Avengers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera Star Wars or whatever. Fine. Uh, Shakespeare, Shakespeare, they weren't completely a non-visual culture, as you can tell from these decorations that I just said. It was a 
they try to transport you visually as well as um, poetically. But the focus was on the art of the language. They were probably better listeners. They were probably better speakers than we are today um, because they got their information mostly from sitting around pubs and not coffee houses yet, uh, not for another hundred years, but sitting around and, and, and talking more because they, they weren't constantly plugged into their, into their cell phones and stuff. Um, they didn't read. Most of them didn't read. Only the well-educated read. So here's some more groundlings. This guy doesn't look like much of a groundling. He doesn't look like he'd smell too bad. Uh, these would have been the nobles, but they're probably just as groundling-ish as these guys. So this is a modern-day version of it. But it's kind of it's kind of neat to, to see it like this. But like I said, it'd be noisy and be busy and they'd be gossiping. They'd be munching. They'd be and they'd be you know running out to count their chickens or whatever these guys did. So the purpose of these throwaway scenes, quote unquote, these these uh, exposition scenes. Uh, was to to re remind people of the plot of what's going on. Now, if you played long narrative video games, that you know you can play these games for 120 hours or something like that, then you have to be reminded at certain points of what the hell's going on because you're you're trying to follow a story, and then all of a sudden you're sidetracked by a million different side quests, uh, and then you're wondering, okay, what was I supposed to be doing? Assassin's Creed is bad for that. Some games do it better than others, just like Shakespeare's plays. Some do it better than others. Some hide the exposition better than others. Um, they, they hide the, the mechanics of storytelling better than others. And gaming is a new, has a new mechanic involved, which is the game element. And be very interesting. I, I, I love them, and I think it's a brand new, very important medium. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, we'll see where that goes. Um, anyway, sorry, getting a bit sidetracked here. Uh, so this old man, uh, he he's 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 standing outside on the castle. He's just the guy on the street kind of thing, and he comments again, as we've seen, about the weird weather. Lennox mentioned that earlier in a previous scene, and he says three score and ten. I cannot remember well. I, I can't remember well. So thirty years or whatever. He's 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 been alive for more than that. I, I can never remember what the hell that was. Who cares? He, he's never seen such a night. He's never seen such a knight, but this sore knight hath trifled former knowings. It's worse than anything else. Fair enough, because, you know, the Satan's minions have just, you know, taken over Scotland. I, good father, thou seest the heavens are troubled with men's act, threaten his bloody stage. So here we go with the, f the fates, retribution, the nemesis, okay? So, so men commit horrors, people commit horrors. And so the natural order is turned upside down. The evil powers come to get their revenge. The nemesis comes to get retribution. By the clock, tis day, and yet dark night strangles the traveling lamp. I'm getting kind of sick of this myself. It's the, it's the appearance versus reality. It looks like daytime, but it's actually night. Everything's turned upside down. Equivocation. Uh, and he, 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 he wonders here, uh, is it night's predominance or day's shame? So is it, is it night that has... Uh, that has emerged predominant or has daytime receded in shame it's actually both i suppose um, day being the powers of good have been have been defeated the powers of good have been defeated duncan is the power of good he's the conduit through which good enters the universe uh, and night the horrors as lady macbeth conjured you murdering ministers the murdering ministers are now predominant Ah, uh, so that darkness does the face of earth in tombs. Well, there's an image for you. There's a wasteland image, if there ever was one. Um, Scotland is entombed. Living light should kiss the face of earth. Lovely image of, of love. And that's not that's, that, that, that doesn't exist anymore. The old man agrees it is unnatural, even like the deed that is done. So an unnatural deed, there's the motif. Nature versus the unnatural, great chain of being, everything's upside down. All these unnatural things happen. A falcon was killed by a little mousing owl. I guess a little tiny owl killed this big, powerful falcon. Weird stuff happening. Nature's going crazy. Nature has been disrupted, the natural order. Uh, here's the horses thing. Uh, I think I made a little mistake yesterday, earlier. I, made, I, I mentioned that uh, the horses ate people. No, they ate themselves. So uh, Duncan's beautiful horses that are usually graceful and swift and loyal and everything else, they went crazy and they made as if they were going to make war on mankind. And it's said that they did eat each other. And Ross says, yeah, I saw them eat each other. So everything's going kind of weird. Um, 
that's enough of that. Good grief, aren't you getting sick of this? Welcome to the world of motifs. I hope it helps you with your essays. I find it, I find it fun, though. Anyway, here comes Macduff. Remember, Macduff is the man of action, and he's the man of few words. And so these guys say, hey, how's the world now? And he says, what do you think? What, see you not? You don't know? Is it known who did the deed? So the question of the day, the question of the hour is who did it? And he replies somewhat sarcastically, I believe, those that Macbeth has, hath slain. So the guys, the guards that Macbeth killed committed the murder. Um, depending on the version of the film that you watch, uh, they will act it as if they don't quite believe what they're saying. But remember, we're living in a wasteland. And when you live in a wasteland, you cannot speak the truth. You have to nod and smile at the official line. And the official line is that the guards killed Duncan. Why? They were bribed by the princes. The prince's two sons have fled. So it makes them look guilty. That's a classic, you know, movie trope, right? You know, if you, if you run away, you're going to look guilty. And sure enough, they do, which puts the suspicion of the deed on them. So, yeah, Macbeths have played it well so far, right? But there's a bit of tongue-in-cheek here because nobody, they're all, they're all waiting. They're all waiting to try to get the sense of, of where things lie. Let me just read this. Macduff accuses the sons of murder. Uh, nobody really believes it, though, uh, but they can't say it aloud. Um, they have to toe the party line and just pretend uh, that they agree with everything. In the wasted, corrupted land, people are punished for speaking the truth. Yes, so we've seen that already. That's a tyranny. Um, so Ross says, yes, two sons killing their father. It's against nature. There you go. Wasteful, thriftless ambition will that will to raven up thine own life's means. So wasteful ambition will cause you to kill your the source of your own life your life's means your father is the source of your life and you'll kill your own life the source of your life your call your father through um wasteful ambition um uh, theme statement yeah it's a little bit a uh, heavy-handed theme statement i suppose but this is as i've mentioned i think you've probably gotten my sense of the play is I got, as a teacher, I got really tired of uh, the ambition theme, the ambition theme. At the simplest level, yes, you can teach, you know, you can teach grade eight students that Macbeth killed Duncan out of ambition. Fine. It's the simplest, it's the simplest answer. And it's not untrue. It's, it's true. He's, he's ambitious, of course. But look at all the things we've talked about. Look at the psychological depth that this play goes to. And I'd like you to focus on that because if you produce an essay for your teacher about that, yeah, you might get your decent mark, but it's not going to be very interesting. I don't think. Prove me wrong. Uh, then tis most like the sovereignty will fall upon Macbeth. So yeah, they did. They played it pretty well, actually. Uh, you kill, you know, you kill the king and you make it look like the two sons have done it. So now who's next in line? Another relative, an I, another high-born, powerful, respected relative. And that would be the cousin Macbeth. Wow. He is already named king, and he's gone to Schoon to be invested with the crown and the robes and the scepter and the orb, all of these trappings. They're called, that's called trappings, the trappings of the kingship. He's already got it. He's wearing the borrowed robes, if you remember that phrase from earlier on. So here's, the, here's that exposition I was talking about. Uh, Macduff is acting kind of like a Hermione Granger here, if you remember her from the Harry Potter books and films. She's brilliant for exposition because she provides all that background knowledge that not Harry and pa, not not Harry and Ron need necessarily the audience needs the audience needs to know where the hell griffins come from so they have Ron and Harry say griffins what's a griffin and then Harry you know Hermione says come on guys don't you pay attention in class and then she opens up another book and she tells us the audience what a griffin is or whatever you know what I mean it, it it's the mechanics what you're looking at is the mechanics of language what we're talking about now is the mechanics of storytelling it's not it's not it's not all art the art is the magic there's a lot of sausage making you know this is an old joke about if you if you if you if you admire the law then don't try to make it don't try to watch it being made. So politicians trying to make laws is like sausages. I, I just butchered that. But any, yeah, there's a pun for you. Anyway, so it, it's the sausage making. It's an ugly process. The, the making of the delicious sausage is an ugly process that you might not want to watch if you enjoy sausages. Anyway, go Google that and you'll, 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 you'll get a better version of it than what I just said. But uh, movie making, 
sausage making. It's it's a mess. It must be a total mess. You know, the art of, of writing anything. There's a lot of just grunt work, grunt mechanics go into it. And so what we're seeing here in this scene is some of that, some of those mechanics. But it's interesting to, now Now you know, now, now you are aware of things. Go watch another movie and try to pick out the scenes. Uh, it's kind of fun. I don't know how useful it is, but anyway, the more you know about anything is the better. Okay, so where's Duncan's body? Uh, he's gone to Columkill, which is the sacred storehouse of his predecessors and guardian of their bones. Well, here's some exposition for you. Do you think every do you think any noble in Scotland doesn't know what Column Kill is? Of course they know what Column Kill is. Macduff did not have to say all that, but he said it not for Ross, but he said it for us in the audience. So there's the sausage making, ladies and gentlemen. Will you go to Schoon? No, I'm going to go to Fife. The Thane of Fife had a wife. Where is she now? Lovely, sad episode coming up. He does. He has a wife and a child, and they're living in the domain of Fife, wherever wherever that is. Go back and look at my map or look it up. Well, I will thither. I think this guy's going to go to Schoon. Yeah. Well, may you see things well done there. Okay, well, all the best to you. So again, there's this, it's a cool, cold reception because for all Macduff knows, Ross is one of the conspirators with Macbeth. Maybe Ross is the murderer. Maybe maybe Ross and and, Mac, and Macbeth are in cahoots. I mean, nobody knows anything. And, and likewise, Ross doesn't know what, what Macduff is all up to. So he's saying, okay, fare you well. Cool, cold, giving nothing away. Adieu. Lest our old robes sit easier than our new. So he says, in case uh, the new guy wearing the king's robes is worse than the old guy. So the old robes will definitely sit easier than the new robes. We saw already that lots of evidence that Duncan was a very good king and we 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 know that Macbeth is not going to be a good one so he suspects that the next couple of months years are going to be nasty ill-fitting clothes uh they're not going to fit um Macbeth at all farewell father he's talking to the old guy God's benisons go with you so he's calling for the grace of God pretty ineffectual it's like a little candle in a gloomy gloomy swamp um and with those that would make good of bad and friends of foe so here's a, a bit of the echo of the foul is fair and fair is foul but he but it's turned up it, even that phrase itself is turned upside down because he's actually making a wish for people who would take a bad situation and make a good take enemies and make them friends so there's actually a wish to re to, to, so everything's foul is fair and fair is foul, but there's a, he's the old man here seems to be want which you know calling on God to to realign things to way that the, the way that they should be. Um, anyway, okay, so that's the act. That's the end of Act um, Two, actually. So Act Three is coming up next. <laughs>